Hey everybody, Danielle Hargenrader here. Welcome to another episode of Unleash Your Inner Diabetes Dominator. Today, I'm really excited to bring you Jenny Smith. Jenny has lived with type one diabetes since she was a child, so she has firsthand knowledge of the day-to-day -day events that affect diabetes management. She attended a diabetes-specific sports training camp in 2008, where she discovered her passion for achieving fitness goals while living healthfully with diabetes. In 2009, she successfully completed her first triathlon. Well, talk about that because that's to me even crazy. <laughs> this brought a deeper understanding of athletic training requirements and the importance of nutrition to realize athletic goals. Jenny holds a bachelor's degree in human nutrition and biology from the University of Wisconsin. She's a registered and licensed dietitian, certified diabetes educator, and certified trainer on most makes and models of insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitoring systems. She is an active member of the American Diabetes Association, American Association of Diabetes Educators, and Team WILD, which stands for We Inspire Life with Diabetes. She is also a contributing author for the Diabetes Sisters website. As a talented dietitian, diabetes educator, athlete, and person with diabetes, Jennifer is in a unique position to assist integrated diabetes services, intensively managed clients. So Jenny, thank you for being here with us today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us, as we always start out with these episodes, about your diagnosis story and whatever you'd like to share with us about the path you traveled from then to where you are now. Sure. Well, that's a long story, right? <laughs> it usually is. <laughs> so uh, I, guess, um, I was diagnosed when I was uh, 13. So that was 27 years ago. So now that gives me my age. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, let's, let's see. Uh, my, my anniversary is on the 15th. Oh, wow. So I, didn't, I just celebrated it too long ago. Um, and let's see, I, I guess I had a great diabetes educator and dietitian in the hospital, which really made a very big difference in, I think, my outlook on management. They were the first ones to tell me, and it was great to hear it right at diagnosis, they were the first ones to tell me that there wasn't anything that I couldn't do. They said that if they could have a career be able to do would be to fly a commercial plane sure. yeah. <laughs> and join the military. Right. And, and at that point, I wasn't really considering those anyway, so I guess it didn't matter, right? Yeah, really. <laughs> so, yeah, that did a lot of wonderful things. And I think that, you know, at some point, I've considered a career in it in general. I mean, it's just my life. Interesting. But, but as I kind of learned a lot more and learned how much nutrition especially affected my management and affected and I started kind of once I got a diet while I started to do a career that was where I am today. Cool. So I, I was gonna say that it sounds like you had a really good experience with your diagnosis. So you had a really good supportive team in the hospital and all that stuff, which is excellent. And I think a lot of us did not have that. Even for me with 24 years ago, you know, I felt, I didn't feel I had gotten much from the seven days I spent in the hospital. You know, they, they gave me an orange to practice shooting insulin into, and it was just, you know, check your blood sugar and go. Like it really was, there was, I don't feel like I got great support. So that's awesome that you got that. And I think that's paramount um, in the beginning that I think that happens more often nowadays um, with the importance of that but so how was so how was like life, life for you in your first you know years with diabetes yeah so you know I had again a, a very supportive group of friends and two of them were really what I would have called my best friends at the time who were very willing to learn um, in fact my very very best friend at the time was, was wanting to know all about the finger stick Mm. Like, what does that feel like? And, you know, so one of the days in the hospital, my educator actually showed her and then would do it. Interesting. So, yeah, so I think, again, and our support it made a big difference um, in how you accept yeah. any type of chronic condition or something chronic that you have to know that Yeah, that's interesting, too, because, yeah, I just, I, and what, what, just out of curiosity, what city or state were you in when you were diagnosed? 
So when I was diagnosed, I was in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. <laughs> okay. Uh, and technically, the little the little city that Manitowoc and Two Rivers. Manitowoc is really the city that has the big, big hospital. Um, it's a community of about thirty-two thousand people. So again, not ginormous by any means. Uh, but, but you know what? They had a great education team, and I had a great pediatric endocrinologist. And I guess it just shows that that you can get good education in a lot of different places. Right. So were you always, as a child in your whole life, were you always into physical fitness and like eating healthy? Was that something you were always involved in or did you become more involved in that after your diagnosis? Well, my dad started very young with my brother and I. My brother's four years younger. He does not have diabetes, thankfully. Um, but he, my, my dad started us out with enjoying exercise. And it was it wasn't like I have to go to swim and you have to bike and you have to run. It was just being um, active, really. He played with us in the yard every single day. He taught us to ride a bike at a great early age. Um, and so I think that was a big part of really remaining active. And once I was diagnosed and understood how very well and exercise I could see the immediate difference in me. Yeah, definitely. So was there a point at which you did you always know that you wanted to be a certified diabetes educator and a nutrition expert and all this stuff? Or was that I mean, you said you considered being a veterinary doctor and things like that. What was there like a moment or was it just an evolution or how did you kind of come about to make that career choice? Was there a, a deciding factor? It was more in high school, really, um, when we were probably junior-ish year when we got to do a little bit of career exploration. Uh, things that we were interested in, we actually had a class where we could um, kind of explore that and then do a little bit of shadowing of different people. And fortunately, we actually had a doctor, a veterinary clinic very close to where my parents' house was. So I did a little bit of shadowing there. And then because of my interest, and my connection to my current diabetes educator. I thought that would be kind of interesting to sit in with them and hear what they tell other people besides just hearing what they tell me, right? Sure. Um, so I did a little bit of shadowing of the dietitian in the hospital who doesn't have do just diabetes, but she sees kind of a gamut of right. nutrition needs. Yeah. And, and then they also shadowed the diabetes educator. Cool. And then you just kind of fell in love with it? Yeah. Cool. So yeah, so I was going to say for those that don't know, um, I know I read it in the bio, but you are working for and with, I shouldn't say for, you're working with Gary Shiner at the Integrated Diabetes Services. And how long have you been doing that? So I have been doing Gary since 2011. Cool. So you do, do you love working with him? Because I just I had the pleasure of interviewing him, I think about two weeks ago at this point. And I had never other than reading his book, Think Like a Pancreas, I never really interacted with him. And he's like really funny and has like a really yeah. good sense of humor. So is that how it is like all the time? <laughs> not, not all the time. I mean, it, it is actually, I would say, probably my perfect thing. Yeah. Honestly, I uh, again, I get to work remotely. So our office, our main office, is in the Philly area, mm -hmm. and Gary and our nurse educator Lisa work there. And then I work remotely for Gary from well, I was working for Madison in Wisconsin. Yeah. So I, I kind of got before my husband in Madison was in uh, the Washington D.C. area. Cool. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. I know of her. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. So, she's also a diabetes educator, very big diabetes advocate. And when we moved to Madison and I took my job, that was very big for me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. 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 So I said, you know, I can't, I can't just be a dietitian who talks to people about lowering their cholesterol every day. That is not, that's not me. That's not yeah. what I want to do. You know, do you know how I can get into either consulting and doing my own business or, you know, whatnot? And so that's how she connected me with Gary. Cool. Well, that's good. That seems like it's, it's working out very well for you. <laughs> it is. 
It is. It's a great job. I get to meet people all over the world. Um, and kind of like, you know, chatting with you, we get to talk diabetes all day. Yeah, so, that's fun. I know most people don't think that's fun. But for me, I mean, I guess the more you're involved with it, like I love talking about diabetes with other people. And that's like we were actually chatting a little bit beforehand. And I was saying, I actually didn't even like know anybody else who had diabetes until I was in my 20s. And I was diagnosed when I was nine. So I went, you know, my whole teenage life, like feeling like I, I mean, I, kind of I knew I knew I wasn't the only person that had it. I knew it like in my mind, but it didn't really make any difference because I was the only person I knew. And then the more I'm able to interact with other people living with diabetes, not only does it make you feel a sense of comfort, but it also makes you feel a sense of belonging. Like there's a family, even though, even if you have a great supportive family, which I, my mother and my husband who thankfully don't have diabetes either, but at the same time, as much as they love me and support me and will do anything to make me feel happy and comfortable, it's just this other unspoken kind of bond that you have with these people any of them it doesn't matter just because they know what you live your life is like every day so it's just it's awesome so yeah. and i think that, um, that emotional psychological component is very specific to people who live it yes it's, it's not, not i also have a very supportive very husband he is my number one like you said before your number one like diabetes supporter right he's your best friend yep but, but my I diabetes friends <laughs> get it on a different realm. Oh yeah, and there's right. nothing there's nothing like it, and that's why I'm such a big advocate for reaching out to the diabetes online community. Whether it's one of the I don't know hundreds or maybe thousands of Facebook pages that exist groups for people with diabetes, or whether it's going on to diabetes.org and just getting jumping into a chat forum and talking to people that way. If you're not ready to, you know, be seen or specifically mm -hmm. identify yourself, it doesn't really matter. You don't even have to say your real name. It's just interacting in that level with those other people. It does offer this really it's kind of an indescribable thing that even for 10 years ago or 15 years ago for me I would have been like I don't know I don't know if that would make a big difference and now I'm like I'm really not sure how I survived without that for as long as I did because it's right. so meaningful to me now well, and that's why know, I bring up the Facebook pages that are specific, that are specific to diabetes. diabetes I think I as think far as our advocates go that, that also extends into the non-diabetes community right mm -hmm. And so when I post something, I don't post it only on diabetes-specific sites. I post on my own so that Me too. everybody gets it. Everybody gets it. Same here. Yep. Because I think it's important. I mean, even my friends who don't have diabetes, friends like from high school, you know, I'll post a picture of my CGM and they'll be like, wow, what's that fancy little gadget you're using now for your VG monitoring, you know? Oh, yeah. um, and it's a way to educate. It's a it way is. to educate the public about things that we live with. Absolutely. And spreading awareness for people who, you know, and we were, I was actually interviewing somebody else, uh, I think it was yesterday, and he was saying how he, what he wants to do is kind of try to help battle the um, this preconceived notion that people have in their mind about like everybody that they say the word diabetes and also all of a sudden this like image of Wilford Brimley pops into everybody's mind like this large old man that's like and it's mostly not a that. It's, yeah like really and like mostly diabetes is not that it's just because that was what was like publicized on tv commercials for so long that's what unfortunately the general population of people who don't know somebody who has diabetes and don't really you know it's not anybody's fault it's just that's the way it ended up kind of panning out and we're here trying to be like hey it's not that's not what we look like and that's not how we roll like we have right. to like, kind of just show people that there's a whole other side to diabetes and it's not doom and gloom it's hey you can do anything you want you can feel great every day for the most part and just like other people other people who don't have diabetes have down days like we have down days too it's just it's dealing with the cards that you're dealt playing the hand that you're dealt and playing it in a in a way that's not you know, making yourself feel limited. And I right. think that's, you know, what we are, well, I'm trying to do, and I know that's, I'm sure what you're trying to do. And most people that I interview are out there trying to kind of push that message out there into the world. And that's what helps by posting on our own face. Like same for me, I post on my, you know, I have a diabetes dominator page, but I also have my own personal page. And I post, you know, pictures of my CGM the other day. I, you know, <laughs> I was saying how I needed to keep my CGM on for one more day because I was going to switch sides with my pump and my CGM. I switched sites like every two weeks 
um, uh -huh. which sides of my hip. And I like, I just taped the crap out of it. And I put a hashtag, hold on for one more day, like Wilson Phillips. And everybody thought that was funny. It didn't matter whether they had diabetes, but then they got to see a picture of the CGM and all the tape. And, you know, people don't always see that because it's underneath my clothes. So, right, you know, right. it's just, it's fun way to get involved. And I think don't be, that brings up a good point too is diabetes, whether it's type one or type two or gestational or whatnot, it is a very, very invisible condition yeah. to live with. Mm -hmm. right? So the presenting <laughs> things like that, like I, I, I were on the pod. Me too. <laughs> and I, I have no issue having it displayed. You know, no. I wear a bikini in the summertime and if it's on my abdomen, that's where it is for the day. You know, yep. if it's on the back of my arm. I, I, I'm sure I'm you probably got that previous question world you want to know what's funny is that because I wear both of mine um, kind of on my lower hip back area and then I you know I switch them around and I haven't worn them anywhere else but I've only been on the Omnipod for one year now and I've been okay. on the CGM for about two and I know I need to like rotate sites so I move them up and down and then side to side and things like that um, and but I have been to all over like I've gone to Mexico and I've you know traveled all over the United States and I do wear a bikini and I swear to you no one has ever asked me anything ever wow. which it's really weird because I would expect like whoa that girl has like two like things hanging off of her <laughs> and I'm sure I've seen people looking at them but I no one's ever said a word to me yeah. about them which and I wouldn't be upset if they did I'd totally just tell them what it was but sure Nobody's yeah, I think the anything. weirdest question that I got was I used to take the subway in every day when I were um, when we lived in the DC area. Um, I would take the subway in every day from our house to the hospital. Like that. And one thing we did with the gentleman in the was, was did I have that? <laughs> And as as the the subway car continued to kind of um, get rid of people at the very end of where we were getting off. He, he, he kind of tapped me on the shoulder and he's like, I'm just really, really curious what's that thing on your arm is. Yeah. And I said, well, what do you think it is? And he was like, well, you don't really look like the type of person, but he said, I'm wondering if it's like one of them roll track <laughs> And I was like, really? Do I look like a convict? <laughs> yeah. um, but I had no idea. It was an insulin pump, and I gave him a little bit of information, and I was like, wow, wow. I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah, I had a, I had one funny story, but it was actually with a family member. I was at a wedding rehearsal dinner, and it was right after I'd gotten the CGM. So this is a couple years ago, and my husband's brother, you know, gave me a big hug, and he felt it on my back, and he like gave me a weird look. I'm like, what? What's up? And he's like. I felt something. I'm like, yeah, you know, it's my CGM. And I started telling him that he's like, you know what? Honestly, I thought you had like stolen that shirt and it had the tag still on it. Like one of those like hard room. I'm like, really? Do I look like that's what I, you've known me for what, <laughs> seven years you, and you think I'm stealing shirts? Like with, and, and how did I get it out of the store with that? No, it's just really funny. But yeah, it's a conversation piece. And I think that a lot of, especially, well, for me, I work with uh, a number of teenage girls mm -hmm. and I find that teenage girls have a real problem with Displaying. wanting to wear the CGM. Now they're used to having the pump because nowadays they'll start people on the pump pretty much right away versus MDI where I did MDI for 23 years. But, yep. you know, even my, I have a 20 year old who's about to turn 21 and she is, and she's beautiful and she's confident and she's amazing, but she's like, and she has worn the Dexcom, but mm -hmm. she just feels very, she doesn't want it there. She's just, I don't want it. I know how she knows how helpful it is. She knows, but she's like, I don't like having two sites. It's weird. I can't hide it. And I think that that comes with as you grow up, as you get more comfortable in your own skin, you know, that kind of thing is like, who cares what anybody thinks? But I, I find that teenagers have a little bit more of a problem with that. And I mean, it's understandable, but at a, at a certain point, you just have to say, who cares what anybody else thinks? And if that's right. the person that thinks something bad about it, then that's probably not somebody you want to be hanging around with anyway. Right. So. It's not somebody who's going to be a lifelong friend for you. Exactly. So cool. So I'm going to ask you what, probably one other question before I ask you for your tips. And, you know, feel free. I'm going to put you on the spot. But do you feel personally there was any like one major thing that you struggled with more than anything else with your whether it was in diagnosis or somewhere throughout your life where you kind of like had an issue and you kind of got over it? Or did you feel like it was kind of smooth sailing for the most part? 
You know, I would say that probably the hardest the hardest time of management for me, I think, would be college. Okay. Uh, was there maybe, maybe, I was, you know, you go out you're on your own. Mom isn't looking any longer for you. Right. You have a million choices in the cafeteria. Yeah. And I think that's not as much as That's true. So sometimes I view the over time you want to eat it in there. In probably I say I I'm not on a monitor at work. Yeah, same. And health at that time weren't the greatest films. I mean no. they're not what we have now. Nope. So I didn't want to be on a pump. Same here. I, I, I totally refused to be on a pump. I was happy with MBI at I had a fairly good A one C at that point in time. I consider back now like that was that was higher than I had really really Long time, but considering being an MBI and all of the struggle, you know, through college stuff, I mean, you eat at weird times, you eat sometimes at, you know, one o'clock in the morning because mm -hmm. you're studying. Um, I would definitely, I would definitely say, say the parties too. Sure. In college, kind of mainly because I was never and still am not, I don't enjoy beer. Yeah, me neither. And I'm not a big alcohol person in no. any way. Uh -huh. So I, I always, always, I always, I always especially when I was of age, age, I was always willing to be the driver. Yeah. But to a degree, psychologically, that also kind of makes you feel a bit outside. Yeah, right? I agree. You feel like you're we're missing something. I mean, friends are like they're having an awesome time being mm -hmm. like drunk off of their job. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think you and I have a lot in common because I would say, you know, as much grief as diabetes caused me or I believed it to have caused me, you know, in my teenage life where I was, you know, kind of having a binge eating problem and I was 200 pounds and I was out of control with my right. management. But at the same time, I was always an, like, I'll say I'm still a nerd. I love to learn. I'm a straight A student. I was always a straight A student. And the one thing about diabetes that I think it was always a gift was that I was afraid to drink. I, I was always not even afraid. Like, I'm, I guess it was more of my need to control things and I yeah. knew that if I would drink then I would probably forget to check my blood sugar and then if I would forget to check my blood sugar then who knows what would happen and because even throughout my teenage years I did have a seizure when I was 14 uh, while I was sleeping and it wasn't even related to drinking it was like I went low in my sleep and I had a seizure and I fell out of bed and I cracked a vertebrae in my lower back and oh, I was wow. just like what if you know I drink and then you know that happens and so I was always like you now like I'm not a drinker like okay like if it's a social occasion I'll have a drink or whatever the case may be but like I attribute and I'm thankful for diabetes for making me not want to experiment with that kind of thing yeah. um, and I just never did and never wanted to you know I just not into it and I guess right. Even if it made me feel like I was missing out, I was always like, well, I guess I'd rather miss out on that than have another seizure or something. Like, that was always. And that's so funny. That's totally my story, too. It's so funny how, like, parallel out to me because that's truly it. I was very afraid of lows overnight. Yeah, definitely. And I never had a seizure. I never had a seizure. I did, though, have and still have. My very, very sensitive time is overnight. Mm -hmm. And so I was very worried about that. So, yeah. yeah. And that was before CGMs. Like, I remember thinking when I was a teenager that, like, CGM was this like futuristic technology that never would really be available to everybody and I always like dreamed about it because I'd read about it somewhere and you know it was experimental right. and I was like when I remember when I got mine just two years ago I mean I just remember holding it in my hand and crying like I couldn't believe that it was available and I had it and it was just a blessing and, and it was a game changer for me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in that seizure that happened when I was 14, you know, that was, you know, getting shot with the glucagon and that was a horrible fallout. And I ended up in the hospital because I had fallen out of bed and I had another seizure, but it wasn't as severe and I didn't fall out of bed, but it was, again, I had to get shot with glucagon twice in my teenage life. And just that whole experience was just like, okay. And neither one of them involved alcohol. So I just assumed that any experimental drug or system thing that would mess up my system, I was like, no, this is not something for me. Um, and I don't hope that anybody has that experience, but maybe if you hear me talking about it and you're thinking about like, oh, drinking's no big deal. I'm, I mean, I'm just, it, just don't do it. <laughs> right, just right, don't right, do right. it. It's not the fun you're going to have. You probably won't remember anyway. So. Right. Right. <laughs> 
I mean, and that's, you know, in, in education, I mean, there are, there are, you are going to have people who want to drink. Yeah. The biggest thing that we do is educate with household with planning. Yeah. You know, so that the problems don't come about later. Right. And I, and I, again, like I think with the CGM that does allow, unless you're not going to look at it, but I mean, cause for me, it was like, you just, you have to check your blood sugar. And anytime I would drink, I would just check my blood sugar, like kind of compulsively, like every 10 minutes, like, what is it now? What is it now? Like, <laughs> exactly. Like, so I'm like, you know what, this is not even fun. Like I'm just psychotic. So I'm not going to do this anymore. So, I'm more obsessive than I usually am. Exactly. So true. That's, that's how I am though. So yeah, that's great. And uh, so, okay. So I was going to say, I'm going to, kind of move into asking what are Jenny's kind of top three tips for you, but also since you have the pleasure of working with so many people with diabetes that you found are maybe the top three things that you, you recommend for thriving with diabetes. So one of the biggest ones is activity. Yeah. Again, I have been trying to add the ability to do something in my life, life, life. pre-diabetes and life life switching. Right. And I would say that's probably number one way to benefit your diabetes management. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be that you, again, do triathlons. I know you're right. going to ask about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I've done two half Ironman. Um, wow. Not the whole half, half, but it's a big right. that's, that's huge. I mean, even for me as someone who does CrossFit and which I think is really intense and like I've done lots of weightlifting and I'm not in super into running, although, you know, I'll do a 5k here and there, but like the thought of a triathlon is like, I'm riding the bike in the woods, like, oh, <laughs> and I feel like I'm in shape. So the thought of a triathlon is like, wow. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks. <laughs> but again, it doesn't mean like, activity doesn't have to be that. It's I agree. Walking your dog, you know, ten minutes after every meal. Yep. Uh, whatever it is, be active. active. Yep. I always tell people that work like in jobs where they have to sit in front of a computer, like set an alarm for once every hour, get up and do, you know, 10 or 15 jumping jacks or 10 or, and then 10 or 15 squats. And who cares if you're in a cubicle and somebody hears you jumping around like, right. so what? Like, you know, or, you know, just lean up against your desk and do 10 push ups against your desk. Like, but like manage it like every hour you're getting up and you're moving and you're stimulating. It doesn't have to be like, like you said, a triathlon or CrossFit or anything like that it's just movement and doing right. it consistently and getting in the habit I agree so yeah my big one that I actually tell people that I work with who work in a building if you don't want to see have people see you moving like you said go to a bathroom on the floor above all of you yeah and take the picture definitely so and easy a couple of times in between Absolutely. So, it can be that easy. Always to see something and I think that's a part of the problem or, you know, the people in general is even for me, this is how I felt before I got into exercising. I thought I overthought it. I, I like made it into this monster of this like a mountain instead of a molehill. That's kind of what I made it. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. It's too much. It's too complicated, but it really can just be the most simple, easy thing. Just don't overthink it. Don't give your mind any time to run away with it. Just get to the stairs and <laughs> just do it. Right. Yeah. It doesn't have to be anything else. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a, a similar expression for the athletes I work with um, who are kind of, you know, they're getting to the point where they're like, oh my gosh, can I keep going? And you know, this is happening. It's you have to feed the athlete, not the monster. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, so if you're not going to strategy, don't feed the diabetes monster. Yeah, that's a great, I like that. <laughs> um, so that would be one activity. Move. Um, second one I think for me is really nutrition. Yes. I think, I mean, it plays a major role. And if you are somebody who is frequently or has a monitor of all you can see the difference between eating real food and eating something that I would say I, I don't want to call food. Yeah, and I feel like um, if we had the time, you and I, because this is really my, I mean, although I'm, I'm a personal trainer and I, nutrition is where it all started out for me. And, you know, I, the last statistic I read is that 80% of what's available to buy in supermarkets today is not actually food. It's food like items. They're, like you said, they're not food. And that's, 80% of what's on sale to the American public. 
it's so scary to think about that. And so you really have to be a little bit more diligent, make those right. choices because you really only have 20% of what's in front of your face to really choose from. I use myself as well as telling people about is most often food that is food is going to spoil it. Oh yeah. Right. Definitely. So mm -hmm. if you can follow the perimeter of the grocery store where all of the produce, your fruits and vegetables and all of that kind of stuff is, uh, the only dry products that might be necessary would be things like wild rice or sure. beans or barley, those things you know that you yeah. can cook. But they're yeah. still real. Like beans too. I'm a big I know a lot of people say yes, yeah, beans, yeah. no beans, but I like beans. I, I eat garbanzo mm -hmm. beans, chickpeas like all the time. So yeah. <laughs> not nuts, nuts and seeds are yep. great too. Um, but, but mostly trying, trying to focus on things that you actually have to refrigerate or you have to keep frozen. Mm -hmm. uh, or that or you have to be used up, up or yep. they're gonna spoil. That's great advice. It's again, yeah, yeah. then you could really simplify it just that easy. It could be, yeah. it could seem overwhelming, but you can really simplify it just like that. Just use that yeah. whole real foods principle. It's gonna go bad or you have to refrigerate it or otherwise, you know, and I know it seems like it's been said so many times, but it's true. I mean, just stay away from stuff that is packaged on a shelf in a bowl or a box or a bag. It's like, right. that's not, you're not gonna go, like I always tell people, you're never gonna walk out into a field and and see bread growing like it's just it's just not a thing it's just it's not real <laughs> not, not at all i know and that's been one you know with all of the products around now on the market that are advocating oh it's oh, now not here fiber, fiber. 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 Yeah. fiber. <laughs> but, but you know you've seen like all the crackers and the chips and even cookies now mm. That are saying no high in fiber, 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 fiber per cookie. cookie but meanwhile high fructose corn syrup is the second or first ingredient Right, right. So. And the fiber is that fiber is not there now. Right. So if so you want you fiber in your diet, diet, eat your fruits and vegetables. vegetables. Yep. Absolutely. There's no better way to get that. There isn't. There isn't. Uh, and this time of the year is a wonderful time of the year to actually get stuff local. Most communities have some type of farmer's market. And often the farmer's market price is going to be less than the supermarket. market. Yes, that's absolutely true. I know where I live, there's a store that's called Produce Junction and I don't I know it's a chain so I don't know what other states that it's in but you can go in there and get a week's worth of fruits and vegetables for probably half or less of the price that you would get them in any supermarket and right. it's just it's easy and there's no reason not to <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So that really takes over to nutrition uh, good one. if you don't know a lot about nutrition or how to change it up you know Find an educator that you can work with that gets, gets, gets it and can start their while where you are in your current kind of meal plan. Right. And work, and work towards what you want. Yep. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It's not like you have to overhaul everything all at once. It's like choose one thing to focus on, focus on that, and then, then when you get that kind of integrated into your life, then move on to the next thing. Because yep, yep. I, all or nothing to me is the number one human form of self-sabotage that we use. It's like, oh, I have to just, go everything all out or else I'm, I'm a failure. No, it's, it's actually the other way around. You have to consider yourself a failure if you're doing that. So you don't, so you can eradicate that, you know, that habit out of your life because you can't make new habits and change everything that you do. It's just not possible. So stop thinking right, right. like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So I guess number three then would be a tip that I actually have to create a friend of mine for um, because I've always, always heard there's a saying numbers are hard to change. Yes. Numbers, numbers are not good bad. bad. It's information. But what she does is she actually looks at the number on her um well she she goes to technical engineer and she says that she a lot of that she says I am wrong. <laughs> nice. And then she puts the blood on the test strip, and as she's waiting for it to come up, she says, and here it comes the number. Yeah, that's great. I love it. She's the fact that a number is going to come up. And it's good information, information about what has happened, happened. Mm -hmm. and, and talking about what she needs to do for what, what she needs to do. Yeah. So, so I think that, that's, that's really, really important for each other psychologically, is knowing, knowing that those are numbers, and, and that they can help us to tweak what, what we're currently doing, learn about it, 
and then to do better at a few things. I think that's great. Like I think exactly what you said. I look at it as data. Like anytime yeah. I have it, I'm like, oh great, this is another piece of data that I can plug into my you know, my daily routine and figure out what's going on and that's it. Yeah, like even if I have a 300, which is rare, but if it happens, I'm not like, I don't beat myself up. I used to, I it used to be just a whole fest of what's wrong with you? Why can't you do this right? And you know, right. I spent so many years of my life playing that game and it was just, it's a vicious cycle and the cycle never ends and it's just, you have to, I love that. And you are awesome, everyone. Like I would say, that's why kind of Diabetes Dominator was, I didn't even have the business of Diabetes Dominator. And I had bought the website and used it as my email address because that's, I had to become that, like to change right. my, to make my personal transformation happen. I like, I had to become like, I had to put on my cape and like become the Diabetes Dominator. Like that's super <laughs> yeah. that, like, I had to become to get past that binge eating and you know really high a1c and thinking that I couldn't exercise and all of these limiting beliefs that I had that were holding me back from being the healthy person that I am today and that was like and then I realized that oh I can inspire people by this transformation and anybody can be a diabetes dominator it's not just me but really it is is like using that information and and being awesome being a superhero because I really believe that anybody who lives with diabetes every day you're a superhero. Like there's just no people, like you said, it's invisible. People don't right. know all those calculations that are constantly going on inside your head. And you don't even, I mean, you don't even realize how much time you're spending, you know, how much insulin's on board, how much insulin do I need? How many carbs are in this? And meanwhile, everybody else is just chatting about some reality TV show and you're like, what? Like, right. yeah, it's like, you're a superhero and you have to right. own right. that. You just have to. <laughs> it's funny to bring up the superhero in, um, well, my husband was doing his master's degree in uh, English and creative writing, and one of his courses was an immersion journalism course, where they had to immerse themselves in either a lifestyle or a job that they had never known about or done anything you know, before. Interesting. And so my husband actually decided after that two weeks, he was going to live with diabetes. Wow. So, so I, I, as an educator, I had access to extra CGM and an extra pump. So, so I actually, you know, we sat down, down and I was an educator, I did a little education, you know, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> and I set it up with the pump, which we use, of course, for sailing. Yeah, I, I, of course. <laughs> but you know, he had to learn how to carve count, and he had to ask for information. Um, one of his first two series was going for a bag, bag of a bag of shop. shop. Huh. And, and he knew that he needed to count the carbs and he couldn't find the information. Yep. So he asked the guy behind the counter, do you have the nutrition facts for your bagels? And it took the guy 15 minutes to find mm -hmm. the nutrition facts for Yeah. While a line built up behind my husband and it was like, like I get it on a more, on a deeper psychological level now. Oh like, yeah. When you have to do things like like in public. Yeah, I was gonna say I love your husband. That's awesome. Even though my <laughs> husband, he's very supportive and he doesn't. And he even says he's like, I can't even imagine, you know, all the calculations that you're doing. Um, but I, I don't know that. I mean, he probably he would wear a CGM because he's like a super science nerd and he would love to know what's going on inside his own body. Like, but um, but I don't know that, that he would be interested in doing that. So your husband's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So he titled he titled his whole paper um, "My Diabetes Superhero." Nice. Yeah, so cause that's what it is. It really is. You have to, you are one, and it's all about, I think it's just accepting it, understanding it, and then finally embracing it and being like, hell yeah, I'm a superhero. Like, there's really, it's just part of your identity, and that's just it. Like, there's no other question about it. So, yeah, that's awesome. So cool. So I'm, you know, of course I will link, you know, your information for integrated diabetes services underneath the video and underneath the blog. Um, is there any other way that you, I mean, if you want other people to reach you, you can tell me, give me any links or is there anything else you you want to share or you're working on or is it, you know, just. I'm actually with, um, I know that a lot of, a lot of viewers, and you, you know Ginger. Yes. Ginger Gara. Yeah, of course. And she has written many books on diabetes and diabetes management. Um, and Ginger and I are working on a uh, type one diet pregnancy. Awesome. So that got a little bit of insight into what might be coming on the market, probably in 2016. Yeah, that that was going to be my next question. Should I ask when we should expect it, or just? <laughs> yeah, probably spring 2016. We're hoping. So um, we'll see. But that's that's kind of in the works. Nice. I mean, what could be better than? 
for people who are going to get pregnant than a book by two women who live with type 1 diabetes who have had pre successful pregnancies. I mean, I don't think that's out there right now. I don't have kids, but um, mm -hmm. I don't think that's anything that's available. So I'm sure that's going to be much needed and very highly welcomed into the awesome. book community. So yeah, sweet. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure I'll post, you'll keep me posted and I'll post about that on social media when it comes out and all that stuff. So cool. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for sharing this. And I'm I'm just excited to have gotten to know you because you're awesome. And I feel you're like we have a ton in common. <laughs> so yeah, everybody out there, um, if you're looking for an amazing certified diabetes educator, definitely going to hit up Jenny. Um, I'll give you the information on the under, under the blog and under the YouTube channel. And uh, if there's nothing else Jenny would like to add, other than looking for that book by her and Ginger Vieira coming out hopefully next year in 2016, we're going to wrap it up. Sounds All right. Great. All right, Thank cool. You. So my pleasure. And uh, I'll catch everybody on the next episode. Take care, guys.